Chapter 67 Muscle Against Metal Roran yelped and jumped aside as a brick chimney smashed to the ground in front of him, followed by the body of one of the Empire's archers. He shook the sweat from his eyes, then moved around the body and the pile of scattered bricks, hopping from one patch of open ground to the next, much as he used to hop along the stones by the Enora River. The battle was going badly. That much was obvious. He and his warriors had remained close to the outer wall for at least a quarter of an hour, fighting off the advancing waves of soldiers, but then they had allowed the soldiers to lure them back among the buildings. In retrospect, that had been a mistake. Fighting in the streets was desperate and bloody and confusing. His battalion had become spread out, and only a small number of his warriors remained close by, men from Carvajal, mostly, along with four elves and several ergles. The rest were scattered among the nearby streets, fighting on their own, without direction. Worse, for some reason that the elves and the other spellcasters could not explain, magic no longer seemed to be working as it should. They had discovered this when one of the elves had tried to kill a soldier with a spell, only to have a Varden warrior fall down dead instead, consumed by the swarm of beetles the elf had summoned forth. His death had sickened Roran. It was a horrible, senseless way to die, and it might have happened to any of them. Off to their right, closer to the main gate, Lord Barst was still rampaging through the main body of the Varden's army. Roran had caught sight of him several times, on foot now, striding among the humans, elves, and dwarves, and dashing them aside like so many ninepins with his huge black mace. No one had been able to stop the hulking man, much less wound him, and those around him scrambled to stay out of reach of his fearsome weapon. Roran had also seen King Oric and a group of dwarves hewing their way through a group of soldiers. Oric's jeweled helm flashed in the light as he swung his mighty war hammer, Voland. Behind him, his warrior shouted, "'Vor Oric's Corda! Fifty feet past Oric, Roran had glimpsed Queen Islanzadi whirling through the battle, her red cape flying and her shining armor as bright as a star amid the dark mass of bodies. About her head had flitted the white raven that was her companion. What little Roran saw of Islanzadi impressed him with her skill, ferocity, and bravery. She reminded him of Arya, but he thought that the queen might be the greater warrior. A cluster of five soldiers charged around the corner of a house and nearly ran into Roran. Shouting, they leveled their spears and did their best to skewer him like a roast chicken. He ducked and dodged, and with his own spear, caught one of the men in the throat. The soldier remained on his feet for a minute more, but he could not breathe properly, and soon he fell to the ground, tangling the legs of his companions. Roran seized the opportunity stabbing and cutting with abandon. One of the soldiers managed to land a blow on Roran's right shoulder, and Roran felt the familiar decrease in his strength as his wards deflected the blade. He was surprised that the wards protected him. Only a few moments before, they had failed to stop the rim of a shield from tearing open the skin on his left cheek. He wished that whatever was happening with the magic would resolve itself one way or another. As it was, he dared not risk leaving himself open for even the slightest blow. Roran advanced toward the last two soldiers, but before he reached them, there was a blur of steel, and then their heads dropped to the cobblestones, surprised expressions on their faces. The bodies collapsed, and behind them Roran saw the herbalist Angela, garbed in her green and black armor and carrying her sword staff. Close by her side were a pair of werecats, one in the shape of a brindle-haired girl with sharp, blood-stained teeth and a long dagger, the other in the shape of an animal. He thought it might have been Solombum but he was not sure. Roran, how nice to see you, said the herbalist with a smile that seemed altogether too cheery, considering the circumstances. Imagine meeting here. Better here than in the grave, he shouted, picking up an extra spear and heaving it at a man farther down the street. Well said. I thought you went with Aragon. She shook her head. He didn't ask me, and I wouldn't have gone if he had. I am no match for Galvatorix. Besides, Aragon has the Eldunari to help him. "'You know?' he asked, shocked. She winked at him from under the lip of her helm. "'I know lots of things.' He grunted and tucked his shoulder behind his shield as he rammed into another group of soldiers. The herbalist and the werecats joined him, as did Horst, Mandel, and several others. "'Where's your hammer?' shouted Angela as she spun her bladed staff, blocking and cutting at the same time. "'Lost! I dropped it!' Someone howled with pain behind him. As soon as he dared... Roran looked back and saw Baldor clutching the stump of his right arm. On the ground, 
His hand lay twitching. Roran ran back to him, leaping over several corpses along the way. Horse was already by his son's side, fending off the soldier who had severed Baldur's hand. Drawing his dagger, Roran cut a strip of cloth from the tunic of a fallen soldier, then said, Err! and tied it around the stump of Baldur's arm, staunching the bleeding. The herbalist knelt next to them, and Roran said, Can you help him? She shook her head. Not here! If I use magic, it might end up killing him. If you can get him out of the city, though, the elves can probably save his hand. Roran hesitated. He was not sure he dared spare anyone to escort Baldur safely out of Rubain. However, without a hand, Baldur would face a hard life, and Roran had no desire to condemn him to that. If you won't take him, I will, bellowed Horst. Roran ducked as a stone the size of a hog flew past overhead and glanced off the front of a house, scattering pieces of masonry through the air. Inside the building, someone screamed, No, we need you. Turning, Roran whistled and picked two warriors, the old cobbler Loring and an Urgle. Get him back to the elves' healer as fast as you can, he said, pushing Baldur toward them. As he went, Baldur picked up his hand and tucked it under his hauberk. The Urgle snarled and said in a thick accent that Roran barely understood, No, I stay, I fight. He struck his sword against his shield. Roran stepped over, grabbed one of the creature's horns, and pulled on it until he had twisted the Urgle's head halfway around. You'll do as I say, Roran growled. Besides, it's not an easy task. Protect him, and you'll win much glory for you and your tribe. The Urgle's eyes seemed to brighten. Much glory, he said, mashing the words between his heavy teeth. Much glory, Roran confirmed. I do it, strong hammer. With a sense of relief, Roran watched the three of them depart, heading toward the outer wall, so that they might skirt most of the fighting. He was also pleased to see the human-shaped werecat follow after them, the feral, brindle-haired girl swinging her head from side to side as she scented the air. Then another group of soldiers attacked, and all thoughts of Baldor left Roran's mind. He hated fighting with a spear instead of a hammer, but he made do, and after a time, the street again grew calm. He knew the respite would be short. He took the opportunity to sit on the front doorstep of a house and try to regain his breath. The soldiers seemed as fresh as ever, but he could feel exhaustion dragging on his limbs. He doubted he could keep going for much longer without making a fatal mistake. As he sat panting, he listened to the shouts and screams coming from the direction of Verubain's ruined front gate. It was difficult to tell what was happening from the general clamor, but he suspected the Varden were getting pushed back, for the noise seemed to be receding slightly. Amid the commotion, he could hear the regular crack of Lord Barst's mace striking warrior after warrior, and then the increase in cries that invariably followed. Roran made himself stand. If he sat for much longer, his muscles would start to stiffen. A moment after he moved away from the doorstep, the contents of a chamber pot splashed across the spot where he had just been. Murderers! shouted a woman above him, and then a pair of shutters banged shut. Roran snorted and picked his way around bodies as he led his remaining warriors over to the nearest cross street. They paused, wary, when a soldier raced past, panic upon his face. Close behind, a pack of yowling housecats chased after him, blood dripping from the fur around their mouths. Roran smiled and started forward again. He stopped a second later when a group of dwarves with red beards ran toward them from deeper within the city. Run right yourself! One shouted. We have a whole pack of soldiers nipping at our heels. A few hundred of them, at least. Roran looked back up the empty cross the street. Perhaps you lost, he began to say, then stopped when a line of crimson tunics appeared around the corner of a building a few hundred feet away. More and more soldiers followed, pouring into the street like a swarm of red ants. Back! Roran shouted. Back! We have to find somewhere defensible. The outer wall was too far away and none of the houses were large enough to have enclosed courtyards. As Roran ran down the street with his warriors, a dozen or so arrows landed among them. Roran stumbled and fell, writhing, as a bolt of pain shot up his spine from the small of his back. It felt as if someone had jabbed him with a large iron bar. A second later, the herbalist was by his side. She tugged at something behind him, and Roran screamed. Then the pain decreased, and he found himself able to see clearly again.
The herbalist showed him an arrow with a bloody tip before throwing it away. Your mail stopped most of it, she said as she helped him to his feet. Gritting his teeth, Roran ran with her to rejoin their group. Every step pained him now, and if he bent at the waist too far, his back spasmed and he found it almost impossible to move. He saw no good places to make a stand, and the soldiers were getting closer. So at last he shouted, Stop! Form up! Elves to the side! Urgles front and center! Roran took his place near the front, along with Jarman, Albrecht, and the Urgles, and one of the red-bearded dwarves. So you're the one they call strong hammer, said the dwarf as they watched the advance of the soldiers. I fought alongside your hearth brother in Farlandur. It is mine honor to fight with you as well. Roran grunted. He just hoped he could stay on his feet. Then the soldiers crashed into them, shoving them back through sheer weight. Roran set his shoulder against his shield and pushed with all his might. Swords and spears stuck through the gaps in the wall of overlapping shields. He felt one scrape against his side, but his hauberk protected him. The elves and the urgles proved invaluable. They broke the soldiers' lines and earned Roran and the other warriors room to swing their weapons. At the edge of his vision, Roran saw the dwarf stabbing the soldiers in the legs, feet, and groin, causing many to fall. The supply of soldiers seemed endless, however, and Roran found himself forced backward step by step. Not even the elves could stem the tide of men, try though they might. Otharia, the elf woman Roran had spoken to outside the city wall, died from an arrow in the neck, and the remaining elves received many wounds. Roran was injured several more times himself, a cut on the upper part of his right calf, which would have hamstrung him if it had been a bit higher, another cut on the thigh of the same leg, where a sword had slipped under the edge of his hauberk, a nasty scrape on his neck, where he hit himself with his own shield a stab wound on the inner part of his right leg that fortunately missed the major arteries, and more bruises than he could count. He felt as if every part of himself had been beaten soundly with a wooden mallet, and then a pair of clumsy men had used him as a target for knife throwing. He dropped back from the front line a few times to rest his arms and catch his breath, but he always rejoined the fight soon after. Then the buildings opened up around them, and Roran realized that the soldiers had succeeded in driving them into the square before Urubain's broken gate, and that there were now enemies behind them as well as before them. He chanced to look over his shoulder and saw the elves in the Varden retreating before Barst and his soldiers. Right! shouted Roran. Right! Up against the buildings! He pointed with his bloody spear. With some difficulty, the warriors packed behind him edged to the side and onto the steps of a huge stone building fronted with a double row of pillars as tall as any of the trees in the spine. Between the pillars, Roran glimpsed the dark, yawning shape of an open archway, big enough to accommodate Sephira, if not Shrukin. Up! Up! Roran shouted, and the men, dwarves, elves, and urgles ran with him to the top of the stairs. There they set themselves among the pillars and repelled the wave of soldiers that charged after them. From their vantage point, which was perhaps twenty feet above the level of the streets, Roran saw that the Empire had nearly forced the Varden and the elves back out the gaping hole in the outer wall. "'We're going to lose,' he thought with sudden desperation. The soldiers charged up the steps once again. Roran dodged a spear and kicked its owner in the belly, knocking the soldier and two other men down the stairs. From one of the ballastae on the nearby wall tower, a javelin streaked down toward Lord Barst. When it was still a few yards from him, the javelin burst into flames, then crumbled into dust as did every arrow shot at the armored man. We have to kill him, thought Roran. If Barst fell, then the soldiers would likely break and lose confidence. But given that both the elves and the coal had failed to stop him, it seemed doubtful that anyone other than Aragon could. Even as he continued to fight, Roran kept glancing at the large, armored figure, hoping to see something that might provide a way to defeat him. He noticed that Barst walked with a slight hitch in his stride, as if he had once injured his left knee or hip, and the man seemed a hair slower than before. So he does have his limits, thought Roran, or rather, the Eldunari does. With a shout, he parried the sword of the soldier who had been pressing him. Jerking his shield up, he caught the soldier underneath the jaw, killing the man instantly. Roran was out of breath and faint from his wounds, so he withdrew behind one of the pillars and leaned against it. He coughed and spat, his spittle contained blood, but he thought that was just from where he had bitten the inside of his mouth and not from a punctured lung. At least he hoped so. His ribs felt sore enough that one of them might be broken. 
A great shout rose from the garden, and Rorn looked around the pillar to see Queen Islanzadi and eleven other elves riding through the battle toward Lord Barst. Again upon Islanzadi's left shoulder sat the white raven, and he cawed and lifted his wings, the better to balance upon his moving perch. In her hand, Islanzadi carried her sword, while the rest of the elves carried spears with banners attached close to their leaf-shaped blades. Rorn leaned against the pillar, hope rising within him. "'Kill him!' he growled. Barst made no move to avoid the elves, but stood waiting for them, with his feet spread wide and his mace and shield by his sides, as if he had no need to defend himself. Throughout the streets, the fighting slowed to a standstill as everyone turned to watch what was about to happen. The two elves in the lead lowered their spears, and their horses sprang forward into a gallop, the muscles beneath their glossy hides flexing and relaxing, as they raced across the short distance that separated them from Barst. For a moment, it looked as if Barst would surely fall. It seemed impossible that anyone on foot could withstand such a charge. The spears never touched Barst. His wards stopped them an arm's length from his body, and the hafts shattered in the elves' hands, leaving them holding useless shards of wood. Then Barst lifted his mace and his shield, and with them he struck the horses on the sides of their heads, breaking their necks and killing them. The horses fell, and the elves upon them jumped free, twisting in the air as they did. The next two elves did not have time to change course before they reached Barst. Like their predecessors, they split their spears on his wards, and then they too jumped free of their horses as Barst struck the animals down. By then, the eight other elves, including Islanzadi, had managed to turn and rein in their steeds. They trotted in a circle around Barst, keeping their weapons pointed at him while the four elves on the ground drew their swords and cautiously advanced toward Barst. The man laughed and hefted his shield as he prepared for their attack. The light caught his face under his helm, and even from a distance Rorin could see that it was broad and heavy-browed, with prominent cheekbones. In some ways, it reminded him of the face of an ergle. The four elves ran at Barst, each from a different direction, and they cut and stabbed at him in unison. Barst caught one of the swords on his shield, deflected another with his mace, and let his wards stop the blade of the two elves behind him. He laughed again and swung his weapon. A silver-haired elf threw herself to the side, and the mace flew past harmlessly. Twice more, Barst swung, and twice more the elves evaded him. Barst showed no signs of frustration, but hunched behind his shield and bided his time, like a cave bear waiting for whosoever might be foolish enough to venture into his lair. Outside the ring of elves, a block of halberd-wielding soldiers took it upon themselves to run screaming toward Islanzadi and her companions. Without pause, the queen lifted her sword over her head, and at her signal, a swarm of buzzing arrows shot out from the ranks of the Varden and fell to the soldiers. Rorin shouted with excitement, along with many of the Varden. Barst had been edging ever closer to the bodies of the four horses he had slain, and now he stepped into their midst so that the bodies formed a low, tumbled wall on either side of him. The elves to his left and his right would have no choice but to leap over the horses if they wished to attack him. Clever, Rorin thought, frowning. The elf in front of Barst darted forward, shouting something in the ancient language. Barst seemed to hesitate, and his hesitation encouraged the elf to come closer. Then Barst lunged forward, his mace came crashing down, and the elf crumpled to the ground, broken. A groan went up from the elves. The three remaining elves on foot were more cautious thereafter. They continued to circle Barst, running in to attack him on occasion, but mostly keeping their distance. Surrender! exclaimed Islanzadi, and her voice could be heard throughout the streets. There are more of us than you, no matter how strong you are. In time you will tire, and your wards will fail. You cannot win, human. No, said Barst. He straightened and dropped his shield with a loud clatter. Sudden dread filled Rorin. Run, he thought. Run, he shouted a half second later. He was too late. Bending at the knees, Barst grabbed the neck of one of the horses, and with his left arm alone, threw the horse at Queen Azanzadi. If she spoke in the ancient language, Rorin did not hear it, but she lifted her hand, and the body of the horse stopped in midair, then dropped to the cobblestones, where it landed with an unpleasant sound. On her shoulder, the raven screeched. Barst was not looking, however, as soon as the carcass left his hand, and sprinted toward the nearest of the mounted elven riders. One of the three remaining elves on foot 
a woman with a red sash tied around her upper arm, ran toward him and slashed at his back. Barst ignored her. Over a flat stretch of land, the elves' horses might have been able to outdistance Barst, but in the limited space between the buildings and the more closely packed warriors, Barst was both faster and more nimble. He rammed his shoulder into the ribs of one of the horses, toppling it over, then swung his mace at an elf upon another horse, knocking the elf from his seat. A horse screamed. The circle of elven riders disintegrated, each turning in a different direction as they tried to calm their mounts and address the threat before them. A half-dozen elves ran out from the nearby press of warriors and surrounded Barst, all hacking at him with frenzied speed. Barst disappeared behind them for a moment, then his mace rose up, and three of the elves flew tumbling away. Then another two, and Barst strode forward, blood and gorse clinging to the flanges of his black weapon. Now! roared Barst, and throughout the square, hundreds of soldiers ran forward and assailed the elves, forcing them to defend themselves. No! Roran growled, agonized. He would have gone with his warriors to help, but too many bodies, both living and dead, separated them from Barst and the elves. He glanced over at the herbalist, who looked as worried as he felt, and said, Can't you do something? I could, but it would mean my life and that of everyone here. Gabadorix as well? He's too well shielded, but our army would be destroyed along with most everyone in Urubane, and even those at our camp might die. Is that what you want? Roran shook his head. I thought not. Moving with uncanny speed, Barst struck elf after elf, felling them with ease. With one of his swings, he caught the shoulder of the elf woman with the red sash and knocked her sprawling onto her back. She pointed at Barst and screamed in the ancient language, but the spell went awry, for another elf slumped forward and toppled out of his saddle, the front of his body split from head to seam. Barst slew the elf woman with a jab of his mace and then continued to run from horse to horse, until he reached Islanzadi on her white mare. The elf queen did not wait for Barst to kill her steed. She leaped out of her saddle, her red cape billowing, and her companion, the white raven, beat his wings as he took flight from her shoulder. Before she alit, Islanzadi lashed out at Barst, her sword a streak of shining steel. Her blade rang as it collided with his wards. Barst retaliated with a counterstroke, which Islanzadi parried with a deft turn of her wrist sending the spiked ball of his mace crashing into the cobblestones. Around them, a space formed as friend and foe alike paused to watch them duel. Overhead, the raven circled, shrieking and cursing in the harsh manner of his kind. Never before had Roran seen such a fight. The blows from both Izanzadi and Barst were too fast to follow. Only a blur was visible when they struck, and the sound of their weapons clashing was louder than all the other noises in the city. Again and again, Barst tried to crush Islanzadi with his mace, even as he had crushed the other elves. But she was too fast for him to catch, and she seemed, if not his equal in strength, at least strong enough to knock aside his blows without difficulty. The other elves, Roran thought, must be aiding her, for she appeared not to tire, despite her exertions. A coal and two elves joined Islanzadi. Barst paid them no mind, other than to kill them, one by one, when they made the mistake of venturing within his reach. Roran found himself gripping the pillar so hard, his hands began to cramp. Minutes passed as Izanzadi and Barst fought back and forth across the street. In motion, the elf queen was glorious, swift, lithe, and powerful. Unlike Barst, she could not afford to make a single mistake, nor did she, for her wards would not protect her. With every moment, Roran's admiration for Izanzadi increased, and he felt he was witnessing a battle that would be sung about for centuries to come. The raven often dove at Barst, seeking to distract him from his Anzadi. After the raven's first few attempts, Barst ignored the bird, for the maddened creature could not touch him, and it took pains to keep away from his mace. The raven seemed to grow frustrated. It shrieked louder and more frequently, and was bolder with its attacks, and with each sally, it edged ever closer to Barst's head and neck. Finally, as the bird again swooped toward Barst, the man twisted his mace upward, changing its path in midair, and clipped the raven on the right wing. The bird cried out in pain, and dropped a foot toward the ground, before struggling to climb back into the sky. Barst swung at the raven again, but Izanzadi stopped his mace with her sword, and they stood facing each other with their weapons locked together at the top, the blade of her sword wedged between the flanges of his mace. Elf and human swayed as they pushed against one another, 
neither was able to gain an advantage. Then Islamzadi shouted a word in the ancient language, and when their weapons met, a harsh, brilliant light shone forth. Squinting, Roran shaded his eyes with his hand and averted his gaze. For a minute, the only sounds were the cries of the wounded and a ringing, bell-like tone that grew louder and louder until it was nearly unbearable. To the side, Roran saw the werecat with Angela cringing and covering its tasseled ears with its paws. When the sound was at the very height of its intensity, the blade of Islanzadi's sword cracked, and the light and bell-like tone vanished. Then the elf queen smote at Barst's face, with the broken end of her sword, and she said, Thus I curse you, Barst, son of Berengar. Barst allowed her sword to fall upon his wards. Then he swung his mace once more and caught Izanzadi between her neck and her shoulder, and she collapsed to the ground, blood staining her corselet of golden scale armor. And all was still. The white raven circled once over Izanzadi's body and uttered a doleful cry, then flew slowly toward the breach in the outer wall the feathers of its wounded wing red and crumpled. A great wail went up from the Varden. Throughout the streets, men cast down their weapons and fled. The elves shouted with rage and grief, a most terrible sound, and every elf with a bow began to fire arrows toward Barst. The arrows burst into flame before they touched him. A dozen elves charged him, but he swatted them aside as if they weighed no more than children. In that moment, another five elves darted in, lifted up Islanzadi's body, and bore her away upon their leaf-shaped shields. A sense of disbelief gripped Roran. Of them all, Islanzadi was the one he had least expected to die. He glared at the men who were fleeing and silently cursed them for traitors and cowards. Then he returned his gaze to Barst, who was rallying his troops in preparation for driving the Varden and their allies back out of Rubain. The pit in Roran's stomach grew larger. The elves might continue to fight, but the men, dwarves, and ergles no longer had a taste for battle. He could see it in their faces. They would break and retreat, and Barst would slaughter them by the hundreds from behind. Nor, Roran was sure, would Barst halt at the city walls. No, he would continue on to the fields beyond and chase the Varden back to their camp, scattering and killing as many as he could. It was what Roran would do. Worse, if Barst reached the camp, Katrina would be in danger and Roran had no illusions as to what would happen if the soldiers caught her. Roran stared down at his bloody hands. Barst had to be stopped. But how? Roran thought and he thought, running through everything he knew about magic, until at last, he remembered how it had felt when the soldiers were holding him and striking him. Roran took a deep, shuddering breath. There was a way, but it was dangerous, incredibly dangerous. If he did what he was contemplating— he knew that he would probably never see Katrina again, much less their unborn child. Yet the knowledge brought him a certain peace. His life for theirs was a fair trade, and if he could help save the Varden at the same time, then he would be happy to give it. Katrina. The decision was an easy one. Raising his head, he strode over to the herbalist. She looked as shocked and grief-ridden as any of the elves. He touched her on the shoulder with the edge of his shield and said, I need your help. She gazed at him with red-rimmed eyes. What do you intend to do? Kill Barst. His words captivated all of the warriors nearby. Roran, no! exclaimed Horst. The herbalist nodded. I'll help however I can. Good. I want you to fetch Dormander, Garsvog, Orc, Grimmer, and one of the elves who still has some authority. The curly-haired woman sniffed and wiped her eyes. Where do you want them to meet you? Right here. And hurry, before any more men flee. Angela nodded, and then she and the werecat trotted away, sticking close to the sides of the buildings for protection. Roran, said Horst, clutching his arm. What do you have in mind? I'm not going to go up against him by myself, if that's what you're thinking, said Roran, nodding toward Barst. Horst appeared somewhat relieved. Then what are you going to do? You'll see. Several soldiers carrying pikes ran up the steps of the building, but the red-haired dwarves who had joined Roran's force held them off with ease, the steps for once giving them the advantage of height over their opponents. While the dwarves fenced with the soldiers, Roran went to a nearby elf, who, with a snarl fixed on his face, was emptying his quiver at a prodigious speed, sending each of his arrows arcing toward Barst. None of them, of course, found their mark. Enough, said Roran. When the dark-haired elf ignored him, Roran grabbed the elf's right hand, his bow hand, and pulled it to the side. 
That's enough, I said. Save your arrows. A growl sounded, and then Roran felt a hand around his throat. Do not touch me, human. Listen to me. I can help you kill a barst. Just let me go. After a second or two, the fingers gripping Roran's neck relaxed. How strong hammer? The bloodthirstiness of the elf's voice contrasted with the tears on his cheeks. You'll find out in a minute, but I have a question for you. Why can't you kill Barst with your minds? He's only one man, and there are so many of you. An anguished expression crossed the elf's face. Because his mind is hidden from us. How? I do not know. We can feel nothing of his thoughts. It's as if there is a sphere around his mind. We can see nothing within the sphere, nor can we pierce it. Roran had expected something like that. Thank you, he said, and the elf made a slight motion with his head in acknowledgement. Garsvog was the first to reach the building. He emerged from a nearby street and ran up the steps with two huge strides, then turned and roared at the thirty soldiers following him. Seeing the coal safe among friends, the soldiers wisely dropped back. Strong Emma! exclaimed Garsvog. You asked, and I have come. After a few more minutes, the others Roran had sent the herbalist to fetch arrived at the great stone building. The silver-haired elf who presented himself was one Roran had seen with Islandadi on several occasions. Lord Dalstair was his name. The six of them, all bloody and weary, stood in a clump among the fluted pillars. I have a plan to kill Barst, said Roran, but I need your help, and we have little time. Can I count on you? That depends on your plan, said Oric. Tell it to us first. So Roran explained as quickly as he could. When he finished, he asked Oric, Can your engineers aim the catapults and ballistae as accurately as needed? The dwarf made a noise in his throat. Not with how humans build their war machines. We can put a stone within twenty feet of the target, but any closer than that is up to luck. Roran looked at the elf lord Delfter. Will others of your kind follow you? They will obey my orders, strong hammer. Do not doubt it. Then will you send some of your magicians to accompany the dwarves and help guide the stones? There would be no guarantee of success. The spells might easily fail or go astray. We'll have to risk it. Roran swept his gaze over the group. So, I ask again, can I count on you? Out by the city wall, a chorus of fresh screams erupted as Barst smashed his way through a bank of men. Garsvog surprised Roran by being the first to answer. You are battle mad, strong hammer, but I will follow you. He made a ruck ruck sound that Roran thought might be laughter. There will be much glory in killing Barst. Then Drummonder said, Aye, and I'll follow you as well, Roran. We have no other choice, I think. Agreed, said Oric. Agreed, said Grimmer, king of the werecats drawing the word out into a throaty growl. Agreed, said Lord Dalfter. Then go, said Roran. You know what you need to do. Go! As the others departed, Roran called his warriors together and told them his plan. Then they hunkered between the pillars and waited. It took three or four minutes, precious time in which Barst and his soldiers pushed the Varden ever closer to the breach in the outer wall. But then Roran saw groups of dwarves and elves run up to twelve of the nearest ballastae and catapults on the walls and free them from the soldiers. Several more tense minutes passed. Then Oric hurried up the steps to the building, along with thirty of his dwarves, and said to Roran, They're ready. Roran nodded. To everyone with him, he said, Take your places. The remnants of Roran's battalion formed a dense wedge, with him at the tip and the elves and urgles directly behind him. Oric and his dwarves took up the rear. Once all of the warriors were in place, Roran shouted, Forward! and trotted down the steps into the midst of the enemy soldiers, knowing that the rest of the group was close behind him. The soldiers had not been expecting the charge. They parted before Roran like water before the prow of a ship. One man tried to bar Roran's way, and Roran stabbed him through the eye without breaking stride. When they were about fifty feet from Barst, who had his back turned, Roran stopped, as did the warriors behind him. To one of the elves, he said, Make it so everyone in this square can hear me. The elf muttered in the ancient language, and then said, It is done. Barst! shouted Roran, and was relieved to hear his voice echo over the whole of the battle. The fighting throughout the streets came to a halt, save for a few individual skirmishes here and there. 
Sweat dripped down Roran's brow, and his heart was pounding, but he refused to feel afraid. Burst! he shouted again, and slapped the front of his shield with his spear. Turn and fight me, you maggot-ridden cur! A soldier ran at him. Roran blocked his sword, and in one easy motion, swept the man off his feet and dispatched him with two quick jabs. Pulling his spear free, Roran repeated his call. Burst! The broad, heavy figure slowly turned to face him. Now that he was closer, Roran could see the sly intelligence that lay in Barst's eyes and the small, mocking smile that lifted the corners of his childlike mouth. His neck was as thick as Roran's thigh, and beneath his male hauberk, his arms were knotted with muscles. The reflections from his protruding breastplate kept snaring Roran's gaze, despite his efforts to ignore them. Barst! My name is Roran Stronghammer, cousin to Aragorn Shadeslayer. Fight me if you dare! or be branded a coward before all here today. No man scares me, strong hammer, or should I say lack hammer, for I see no hammer upon you. Roran drew himself up. I need no hammer to kill you, you beardless bootlicker. Is that so? Barst's tiny smile grew wider. Give us room, he shouted, and waved his mace at the soldiers and Barden alike. With the soft thunder of thousands of feet treading backward, the armies withdrew, and a wide, circular area formed around Barst. He pointed his mace at Roran. Galbatorix told me of you, Lackhammer. He said that I was to break every bone in your body before I killed you. What if we break your bones instead? said Roran. Now, he thought as hard as he could, trying to shout his thoughts into the darkness that surrounded his mind. He hoped the elves and the other spellcasters were listening as promised. Barst frowned and opened his mouth. Before he could speak, a low, whistling noise sounded over the city, and six stone projectiles, each the size of a barrel, hurtled over the tops of the houses from the catapults on the walls. A half-dozen javelins accompanied the stones. Five of the stones landed directly on Barst. The sixth missed and went bouncing across the square like a rock across water, bowling over men and dwarves alike. The stones cracked and exploded as they struck Barst's wards, sending fragments flying in every direction. Roran ducked behind his shield and nearly fell as a fist-sized chunk of stone slammed into it, bruising his arm. The javelins vanished in a flare of yellow light, which gave a ghoulish light to the clouds of dust that floated upward from Barst's location. When he was sure it was safe, Roran looked over his shield. Barst was lying on his back amid the rubble, his mace on the ground next to him. Get him! Roran bellowed and ran forward. Many of the gathered Varden started toward Barst, but the soldiers they had been fighting shouted and attacked, stopping them from covering more than a few steps. With a roar, the two armies turned on each other once again, both factions inflamed with a desperate anger. As they did, Jormander emerged from a side street, leading a hundred men whom he had collected from the edges of the battle. He and those with him would help hold back the scrum of combatants while Roran and the others dealt with Barst. From the opposite side of the square, Garzvog and six other coal charged out from behind the houses they had been using for cover. Their pounding footsteps shook the ground, and men of both the Empire and the Varden scrambled to move out of their way. Then hundreds of werecats, most in their animal forms, slipped out from the main body of the intermingled armies and streamed across the cobblestones, teeth bared, toward where Barst lay. Barst had just begun to stir when Roran reached him. Grabbing his spear with both hands, Roran brought it down on Barst's neck. The blade of the weapon stopped a foot away, and the tip bent and snapped as if it had struck a block of granite. Roran cursed and continued to stab as quickly as he could, trying to keep the Eldunari within Barst's breastplate from recovering its strength. Barst groaned. Hurry! Roran bellowed at the Urgles. Once they were close enough, Roran sprang aside so that the coal would have the room they needed. Taking turns, each of the massive Urgles struck at Barst with their weapons. His wards blocked them, but the coal continued to hammer away. The sound was deafening. Werecats and elves gathered around Roran. Behind them, he was half aware of the warriors he had brought with him holding off the soldiers, along with Jormander's men. Just when Roran was beginning to think that Barst's wards would never give way, one of the coal uttered a triumphant shout, and Roran saw the creature's axe glance off the front of Barst's armor, denting it. Again, shouted Roran. Now, kill him! The coal lifted his axe out of the way, 
and Garsvog swung his iron-bound club toward Barst's head. Roran saw a flurry of motion, and then there was a loud thud as the club struck Barst's shield, which the man had pulled over himself. Blast it! Before the Urgles could attack again, Barst rolled up against the legs of one of the coal, and his hand latched onto the back of the coal's right knee. The coal bellowed with pain and hopped backward, pulling Barst out of the knot of coal. The Urgles and two elves closed in around Barst once more, and for a number of heartbeats, it seemed as if they might subdue him. Then one of the elves went flying, her neck crooked at an odd angle. A coal fell onto his side, shouting in his native language. Bone protruded from his left forearm. Garzvog snarled and jumped back in, blood streaming from a fist-sized hole in his side. No, thought Roran, growing cold. It can't end like this. I won't let it. Shouting, he ran forward and slipped between two of the giant urgles. He barely had time to see Barst, bloody and enraged, with his shield in one hand and a sword in the other, before Barst swung his shield and struck Roran on the left side of his body. The air rushed out of Roran's lungs, and the sky and the ground spun around him, and he felt his helmet-covered head bouncing against the cobblestones. The world seemed to keep moving beneath him even when he rolled to a stop. He lay where he was for a time, struggling to breathe. At last he was able to fill his lungs with air, and he thought he had never been so grateful for anything as he was for that breath. He gasped. Then he howled as his body filled with pain. His left arm felt numb, but every other muscle and sinew burned with agony. He tried to push himself upright and fell back onto his stomach, too dizzy and hurt to stand. Before him was a fragment of yellowish stone, veined with coiled branches of reg agate. He stared at it for a while, panting, and the whole time, the only thought running through his mind was, Have to get up. Have to get up. Have to get up. When he felt ready, he tried again. His left arm refused to work so he was forced to rely on his right alone. Hard as it was, he got his legs underneath him, and then he slowly rose to his feet, shaking and unable to take more than shallow breaths. As he straightened, something pulled in his left shoulder, and he uttered a silent scream. It felt as if a red-hot knife were buried in the joint. Looking down, he saw that his arm was dislocated. Of his shield, nothing remained but a splintered board still attached to the strap around his forearm. Roran turned, searching for Barst, and saw the man thirty yards away, covered in clawing werecats. Satisfied that Barst would be occupied for at least a few more seconds, Roran returned his gaze to his dislocated arm. At first he could not remember what his mother had taught him, but then her words returned to him, faint and blurred by the passage of time. He pulled off the remnants of his shield. Make a fist, mumbled Roran, and he did so with his left hand. Bend your arm so your fist pointed forward. That he did, though it worsened his pain. Then turn your arm outward, away from your... He screamed a curse as his shoulder grated, the tendons and muscles pulling in ways they were not supposed to stretch. He kept turning his arm and he kept clenching his fist, and after a few seconds, the bone popped back into the socket. His relief was immediate. He still hurt elsewhere, especially his lower back and ribs, but at least he could use his arm again, and the pain was not so excruciating. Then, Roran looked toward Barst again. What he saw sickened him. Barst was standing in a circle of dead werecats. Blood streaked his dented breastplate, and clumps of fur clung to his mace, which he had retrieved. His cheeks were scratched deeply, and the right sleeve of his male hauberk was torn, but otherwise he appeared unharmed. The few werecats who still faced him were careful to keep their distance, and it looked to Roran as if they were about to turn tail and run. Behind Barst lay the bodies of the coal and the elves he had been fighting. All of Roran's warriors seemed to have disappeared, for none but soldiers surrounded Roran, Barst, and the werecats, a seething mass of crimson tunics, the men pushing and shoving as they struggled against the eddies of the battle. Shoot him! Roran shouted, but no one seemed to hear. Barst noticed, however, and he began to lumber toward Roran. Lockhammer! he roared. I'll have your head by this! Roran saw a spear on the ground. He knelt and picked it up. The motion made him lightheaded. Let's see you try, he replied. But the words sounded hollow, and his mind filled with thoughts of Katrina and their child, who was yet to be. Then one of the werecats, who was in the form of a white-haired woman no taller than Roran's elbow, ran forward and cut Barst along the side of his left thigh. Barst snarled and twisted, 
but the werecat was already retreating, hissing at him while she did. A moment more, Barst waited to ensure that she would not trouble him again, and then he continued walking toward Rorn, limping now as his new wound exacerbated the hitch in his stride. Blood sheeted down his leg. Rorin wet his lips, unable to look away from his approaching foe. He had only the spear. He had no shield. He could not outrun Barst, and he could not hope to match Barst's unnatural speed or strength. Nor was there anyone nearby to help him. It was an impossible situation, but Rorin refused to admit defeat. He had given up once before, and he would never do so again, even though reason told him that he was about to die. Then Barst was upon him, and Rorin stabbed at his right knee, in the desperate hope that he might, by some chance, cripple him. Barst deflected the spear with his mace, then swung at Rorin. Rorin had anticipated the counterattack and was already stumbling backward as fast as his legs would allow. A gust of wind touched his face as the head of the mace swept past, inches from his skin. Barst showed his teeth in a grim smile, and he was about to strike again when a shadow fell on him from above and he looked up. Islanzadi's white raven dropped out of the sky and landed on Barst's face. The raven screeched with fury as it pecked and clawed at Barst, and Rorin was astonished to hear the raven say, Die! 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 Barst swore and dropped his shield. With his free hand, he batted the raven away, breaking its already injured wing. Ribbons of flesh hung loose from his brow, and blood painted his cheeks and chin crimson. Rorin lunged forward and stabbed Barst's other hand with his spear, causing Barst to drop his mace as well. Then Rorin seized his chance and stabbed at Barst's exposed throat. However, Barst caught the spear with one hand, tore it from Rorin's grip, and broke it between his fingers as easily as Rorin might break a dry twig. Now you die, said Barst, spitting blood. His lips were torn and his right eye was ruined, but he could still see out of his remaining orb. The man reached for Rorin, seeking to envelop him in a deadly embrace. Rorin could not have escaped even if he had wanted to, but as Barst's arms closed about him, Rorin grasped Barst's waist and twisted with all his might, putting as much weight and pressure as he could on Barst's wounded leg, the leg with the hitch. Barst held for a moment, then his knee buckled, and with a cry of pain, he fell forward onto one leg and caught himself with his left arm. Squirming around, Rorin slipped out from under Barst's right arm. The blood on Barst's breastplate made it that much easier to work free, despite the man's immense strength. Rorin tried to grab Barst's throat from behind, but Barst tucked his chin, preventing Rorin from getting a grip. So instead, Rorin wrapped his arms around Barst's chest, hoping to restrain him until someone else could help kill him. Barst growled and threw himself onto his side, jarring Rorin's injured shoulder and causing him to grunt with pain. The cobblestones dug into Rorin's arms and back as Barst rolled three times. When the bulk of the man was atop him, Rorin had trouble breathing. Yet still, Rorin maintained his grip. One of Barst's elbows slammed into his side, and Rorin felt several of his ribs break. Rorin clenched his teeth and tightened his arms, squeezing as hard as he could. Katrina, he thought. Again, Barst's elbow slammed into him. Rorin howled, and flashing lights appeared before his eyes. He squeezed even harder. Again, the elbow, like an anvil pounding into his side. You shall not win the hammer, grunted Barst. He staggered to his feet, dragging Rorin with him. Though he thought he might tear the muscles from his bones, Rorin tightened his embrace even further. He screamed, but he could not hear his voice, and he felt veins pop and tendons snap. And then Bar's breastplate caved in, giving way where the coal had dented it, and there was a sound of crystal breaking. No! shouted Barst, even as a pure white light erupted from the edges of his armor. He went rigid as if chains had pulled every limb to its farthest reach, and he began to shake uncontrollably. The light blinded Rorin and burned his arms and face. He released Barst and fell to the ground, where he covered his eyes with his forearm. The light continued to pour out from under Barst's breastplate until the edges of the metal began to glow. Then the blaze ceased, leaving the world darker than before, and what little remained of Lord Barst tumbled backward and lay smoking on the cobblestones. Rorin blinked as he stared at the featureless sky. He knew he should rise, for there were soldiers nearby, but the cobblestones seemed soft beneath him, and all he really wanted to do was close his eyes and rest. When he next opened his eyes, 
He saw Oric and Horst and a number of elves gathered around him. Rorin, can you hear me? said Horst, peering at him with concern. Rorin tried to speak, but he could not form the words. Can you hear me? Listen to me. You have to stay awake. Rorin! Rorin! Again, Rorin felt himself sinking into blackness. It was a comforting sensation, like wrapping himself in a soft woolen blanket. Warmth spread through him, and the last thing he remembered was Oric bending over him and saying something in Dwarvish that sounded like a prayer.